Um, homework nine is due on Monday and um, the project, I'm starting to get occasional email questions from people, although not as much as I would expect. You know, I can kind of have a, an idea of how much work people are spending on the project based on the number of questions I get, how often people want to come check answers. It's been pretty quiet so far. So I'll say that this project I think is easy if you give yourself a little bit of time to think about it and make adjustments, but it's very hard if you wait until Thursday, November 16th. You'll find the project to be almost impossible if you don't start it until the day before it's due. All right, so today we're going to continue some of these um, supplementary analysis methods. Today we're going to be looking at different, uh, one different way to determine how long to own equipment before it's replaced. So before we start talking about economic service life, does anybody have any questions related to the announcements? All right, this is a picture of uh, a car that I bought back in 2009. Um, it was a Mazda Miata. I lived in a, uh, a hilly area on windy country roads. The Mazda Miata does really well. It's not a particularly fast car. But it's fun to drive on curves because it's got a really low center of gravity. It's a small car. I also have come to appreciate how easy it was to park in tight parking spaces because around here it seems like everybody wants to have a, like a gigantic truck that's super long. And so to get into a parking space, sometimes you're avoiding these super long trucks that always seem to have a tow hitch on the back as well, hanging out another 18 inches. So. Um, anyways, I bought this car. It was used. I bought it in uh, 2009 for $7,500. And um, it worked great. It wasn't super practical, especially because I've got two kids and it just has, you know, one seat for a passenger. Not practical, but it was a lot of fun. And finally, I grew up and decided to sell it in March of 2021. So it only took me, what, 12 years? to uh, decide that a convertible wasn't the most uh, practical car. So this is the lady who bought it and she's driving it off. I sold it for $3,500. So that's not pretty, that's not bad, right? Um, I kept it for that long, 12 years, and uh, the net difference between the two is $4,000. Now, we know by now that it's not, it's not that simple because those Dollars in 2009 have different value than the dollars in 2021. So we can't simply say that my cost of ownership per year was 12 years and $4,000. It's more complicated than that. But I bring up the example just as an illustration of some of the decisions that you may face, both personal and also professional, having to do with how long to keep things. So. Like, why ultimately would you choose to uh, replace equipment? In my case, it was partly a mix of uh, practicality, wanting to be able to have more passengers. It was partly because the suspension was going a little bit soft, and I didn't want to spend the money to get that rebuilt. It was getting a little bit of rust in one spot, which I didn't like. But um, in economic terms, what we're going to do is look at a technique that will tell us how many years is the optimal duration to own equipment. Because remember that when we're trying to be efficient as a nonprofit organization or when we're trying to maximize profits as a for-profit organization, what we want to do is minimize our expenses. So the best thing you can do, whether you're a government agency or a charity or a business, is keep your expenses low. And that applies in your personal life as well. That's part of the reason why I kept that car for so long is it was basically free, you know, like when you've paid for it and the only thing you have to do is change the oil and put in new spark plugs every 40,000 miles, it's basically free transportation. Except for the fact that when th something starts to break down a little bit more often, like when I was facing the, uh, the idea of having to replace the suspension, I didn't want to do that. So if we think about some of the motivating factors that may cause us to replace an item, it may, that, it may be that the uh, performance of the equipment is starting to become degraded. And the way that we could measure that is that maybe uh, its operating costs are going up over time. 
its performance being degraded could be that the safety is worse than it used to be. You know, like if the brakes don't work quite as well, or if you find on a wet day your car seems to be sliding over the road because the tires are worn down. Um, and it's not just cars, obviously. There's lots of kinds of equipment that will have reduced performance as the equipment gets older, almost everything. It could be that whatever it's generating has less quality than it used to. If it's a mill or a lathe or some sort of a tool, it could be that it's just not um, performing the way that it did when it was new. So maybe that's one reason to replace an item is when the performance is degraded. It could be that the, uh, the needs of industry have evolved since you purchased the item and that the item can no longer generate the, uh, <clears throat> the types of specifications that are starting to uh, become more commonplace. So if you had an old steel mill that just for whatever reasons having to do with the way it was set up or the type of input stocks it could use, maybe it's just not producing the same grade of steel that the market demands any longer. Uh, that maybe would be a reason to uh, replace items is if you can't produce what needs to be purchased any longer. Or it could be that neither of those things are true, that it works as well as it ever did and that you're still doing the same thing as before, but just for whatever reason the item is now obsolete. So this is a picture of what was called the Apple II computer. And this is what I learned how to do coding on when I was in uh, middle school, our school had rooms of these and uh, the monitor was just green and black. It didn't have a hard disk. You could only store data on a floppy drive. And if we had one here, we could turn it on and still write a paper on it. it it's not that people don't write papers anymore and it's not that its performance was degraded, but it's just obsolete because there are other machines that have a more comfortable user interface or they will correct the language on the fly. So the improved performance of other pieces of equipment makes it less competitive to try and do your work with obsolete equipment or tools. So those are some of the reasons why you may consider whether or not to replace an item. But you shouldn't just make it a subjective decision. You shouldn't just list one of these reasons and say, and therefore I'm buying a new thing. And the worst example of this, I think, is when people say that they're buying a new car because they want to get improved fuel economy. And they'll, they'll say that like they're really making a smart economic choice because they want to save money on buying gas. But they've almost never actually run the numbers on, is it cheaper to drive your old car, which has slightly worse fuel economy, versus the new car, which gets better at fuel economy? Usually people are just saying that because they want a new thing. It's not because they actually have run the numbers and it's going to save them money in the long run to save a little bit on fuel. So we need to be quantitative about it. We need to make the uh, replacement decision to minimize our costs. Now owning a piece of equipment, owning an item, has two main sources of cost or two categories that we can say the cost is attributable to. And one, you'll remember the notion of capital recovery is that what you could do is you could calculate an annualized equivalent of the initial purchase price, which occurs at the present, and the disposal value, sometimes called the salvage value, at the end of the item's useful life. So in my case of that uh, Mazda Miata, the capital cost was $7,500. The salvage value was $3,500. I could calculate the capital recovery by taking into account the interest rate that applies over that period. And that interest rate would discount the salvage value to the present. Then I'd find some net present value. And then I'd use the interest rate again to find the equivalent annual amount. And so the capital recovery cost of that car is not just 7,000 minus 35, I'm sorry, yes, 7,500 minus 3,500 divided by 12. It's not that simple. We need to know what interest rate prevailed over that period to know the true annual cost of just owning the equipment. So that's one category of the costs is the capital recovery, which is just the initial purchase price and the salvage. 
The other component of cost has to do with the operation and maintenance expenses. And so when your car is breaking down more often, when it's burning oil, when um, towards the end of its useful life, those costs begin to add up more, you might see that in the early years, the costs are more or less constant. And especially if the vehicle has a warranty or the equipment has a warranty, uh, it could be that you just have certain maintenance expenses like changing the oil, rotating the tires, but there aren't yet any repairs that you have to do beyond those preventative things. And then the longer you own it, for whatever reason, it could be increasingly expensive to keep the item functional. So this is a pretty common thing, that the older it is, just the more costly it is to keep it operational. Now it's not always going to follow like a perfect progression like this. It could be more jagged. It could be that you have a big expense in year six, slightly less in year seven, more in year eight, but on average, like if you had a whole fleet of vehicles, the average uh, could be that the older it is, the more costly it is to maintain and operate the equipment. So does everybody understand this so far? The idea that we have two components of costs. Any questions about this? Do you remember when I told you that uh, external rate of return was one of the most complicated things in the course? This is the other one, what we're going to do today. So if you're good about external rate of return and you figure out how to do what we're going to do today, that's like the summit of Mount Difficult in this class. And everything else is a little bit easier. And I think you can get there, but not if you're letting your mind wander today. Uh, today's definitely the day to be focused and really try and uh, follow what we're talking about. So let's talk about those operating costs. We understand maybe conceptually why the costs would be going up over time. It's because the equipment's breaking down more. So these are the actual annual operating costs. They're gradually going up over time. But some companies don't want to deal with constantly increasing equipment costs. And so what they may prefer to do instead is like finance it so that every year they have a constant expense. And so they could have like a fleet management plan that they've purchased with an auto repair shop where the auto repair shop says, you pay us $1,000 a year and we'll handle anything that comes up. And so there are ways either through that, like a, a repair arrangement with an outside provider, or you could just save money in the early years and then use that pool of money to pay the expenses as they go up over time. You could like self-finance if you anticipated what those repair costs were going to be over time, it would be possible, instead of having variable costs in every year, you could make it so that you had equal operating costs. So does everybody understand why there would be an advantage in that if you're trying to operate a business to have your expenses be constant every year instead of gradually going up? It's easier to plan when things aren't changing over time. So one of the things that you're going to do in today's in-class exercise is you're going to take some cost data that's gradually going up over time and you're going to find the annual equivalent of it. So you're going to find out how much, if it was going to be the same amount every year, how much would it be instead of having this gradually increasing operating costs over time. And so the method that you do, think about your strategy, your time value of money steps. You discount everything to the present times zero. And then when you found the present value of it, then you're going to spread that out over the eight years equally using find A given P. Or if we're doing it on Excel, that's the PMT function. PMT is the function that allows you to find out the annual equivalent of some present or future cost. So there's going to be a step that's embedded in the template that I give you today that we're doing this. And I wanted to speak of it separately so that you conceptually you understood, like, it's not good enough just to know, like, what button to click in the, uh, in the template. You need to know conceptually what's happening and why. 
And so the rationale here is that for us to know what's the overall cost, we have to be able to find the annual worth of the annual operating costs. <coughs> okay. Now, this, what I've done is I've taken eight years of ownership and found the annual equivalent of the annual operating costs. The length of these arrows represents how much expense there is. What if you'd only owned the item for three years? Would these arrows be longer or shorter than how they look now with eight years? They'd be shorter because in the first three years you have less costs. So the longer you own equipment, the higher the annual worth of the operating cost is going to be. And the shorter you own the equipment, the less the annual operating costs will be. Okay, I'm going to allow you to digest this figure for a moment. See if you can figure out what it means. And then we'll talk through it together. So I've mentioned that there's two different kinds of cost. Broadly speaking, when you own equipment, there's the capital recovery cost, which has to do with the purchase price versus the salvage value, and then annualizing that. And then there's the annual operating costs, which has to do with the maintenance and operations. So if you own an item for just a short period of time, like if you buy a car, drive it off the lot, keep it for one year, and then you get rid of it. At that short end of the spectrum, a few number of years, you'd have relatively low operating costs because it's in good repair and it's not needing much maintenance. But you'd have high capital recovery costs. You've probably heard about depreciation and that as soon as you drive a vehicle off the car lot, they say you've already lost 10% of the value. Depends on the car, I think. Um, but you've lost some value just in that first period of time you lose kind of a lot of value but then the longer you own it with each incremental year you're not losing very much value like if I'd kept my Miata for 13 years instead of 12 years I probably could have sold it for the same price and so the capital recovery costs you'll notice that they start high and they gradually get lower because you're spreading out the ownership over a greater number of years. That initial purchase price is the main driver of capital recovery costs. And so if you're spreading out the initial purchase price over a longer period of time, then the cost per year is getting much lower. And keep in mind, look at the vertical axis here, this is the annual worth of costs. So this is dollars per year. So how much does it cost me per year to own a vehicle if I own it for 13 years? that annual cost is going to be spread out over such a long period that the amount will be small. But if I only own the vehicle for one or two years, then my annual uh, cost of ownership based on capital recovery is high. Okay, so that explains the curve of capital recovery. This curve for the annual worth of annual operating costs, it's going up. Because if you own the item for 13 years and it's breaking down a lot, then your annual ownership costs, if you spread it out so that it's equal over the entire series, are going to be higher than if you'd, order, if you'd only owned it for a shorter period of time and you have much lower expenses in those early years. So those are the two components of cost. And the thick blue line here is the sum of the two. So if you add together, the operating costs and the capital recovery costs, that gives you the total annual worth of costs. And our objective in economic service life analysis is find out how many years of ownership is going to minimize the total combined annual worth of costs. So how long should you own an item? You should own it the number of years that minimizes your costs. So that's an objective statement that if you want to minimize your expenses, then you should own it for however long gives you the lowest cost per year. So there's going to be some minimum point when we add together the costs. Any questions so far?
When we do a replacement study and we're comparing two different alternatives, we'll do an economic service life comparison between the item we already own and some challenger, which is the equipment that we may replace it with. So the defender is the item that you own right now, and the challenger is the thing you're thinking of replacing it with. Um, market value is how much you could sell the currently owned equipment for if you sold it at time zero. And we're going to define the economic service life as how long you should own an item on the basis of minimizing the cost. So a replacement study is calculating the economic service life of your current equipment along with the economic service life of the equipment that you'd replace it with. And then you either keep your item that you already own or you buy a new item based on of the two alternatives which has the lowest total annual worth of costs. Now when you are calculating the first cost of the defender, then you just use its current market value. And the challenger's first cost is how much it would cost to actually purchase the item that you don't own yet. And uh, one of the things that we have to be really careful about in replacement studies is ignoring the sunk costs. You may have heard that phrase before, sunk costs. It means the uh, amount of money that you've spent in the past. And you can have like an emotional attachment to items, to equipment. Uh, if you've spent a lot of money in the past repairing it, that could make you think, well, I can't give up now. I need to keep spending more to justify how much I spent in the past. Like if I had, uh, well, I did in the case of that Miata. Let's see. You can't tell because the top's down here, but it, it started off with a tan top, and I replaced it with a black top. So that cost not too much. It was like $1,500. But in my mind, if I had thought, well, I spent so much money putting that top on, I don't want that money that I spent in the past to go to waste, so therefore I should also put in the uh, new suspension. You have to avoid that because the money that you've spent in the past, it's gone. It's never coming back. And so the uh, commonly expected attitude in economic analysis is that previous expenditures that can't be recovered should be ignored when doing a replacement study. So it may indirectly, the, the money that you've spent in the past may indirectly affect its, uh, its current market value, and that is included in a replacement study. But aside from that, the previous expenditures are ignored. OK, let me hand out the in-class exercise for today. And there's a template file that I put onto Blackboard. So it's an Excel spreadsheet that you should uh, download just off of the uh, front page of the class website. So the template file that you need to get off of uh, Blackboard looks like this. So I've given you some uh, explanation on the handout and also in the template itself on how to fill in each of these columns. So see how where it says A, column A is the year. That's given. Column B is the market value. So this equipment that you own right now, if you sold it at the end of the first year, it would have a salvage value of $10,000. If you sell it at the end of the second year, it has a salvage value of $8,000. So its salvage value is constantly going down the longer you own it. And you can see that the operating costs are going up. So column D is maybe uh, one of the more tricky columns. And so I'm going to pull up that template file and uh, maybe we can talk through together how to solve this one. I think the first time you see an economic service life, maybe it's good for us to do it at the same time rather than asking you to uh, do this one on your own.
So what does it say in the handout here? This is a piece of equipment that's purchased for $20,000. So one thing to point out is that we need to be really careful about outflows versus inflows when we do economic service life analysis. So we've got 10% interest, so 0.1 in this interest rate field. The first cost, negative $20,000. So um, we're going to buy it at time zero for $20,000, and then if we sell it, You'll notice that the market values are positive. So those are not minus, they're positives. And then the operating costs are going up over time. Okay, so column D, the present value of the cumulative operating costs to date. So what we should do with this one for column D is use the NPV function for whatever operating costs we've encountered so far. So if we just own it only for one year, the only operating cost is 5000 at year one. And we want to find out what is the equivalent of that at time zero. So I'm going to do equals NPV. The rate we need to refer to is this interest rate of 10%. I'll use the F4 button to anchor it with the dollar signs. And then the value, there's only one value. If we're on year one, the only operating cost so far has been this $5,000. And uh, that is $5,000 at year one. We want to find out what is the equivalent of that at year zero. So the NPV function is one of the rare Excel functions that we don't have to manually put the minus sign in to make sure you know, like that it doesn't change signs. PV, FV, PMT, those do change signs, but NPV doesn't. So you'll notice I did not put a minus sign. I just referred to this. So 5,000 at year one is the same as 4545 at year zero. So this is the present value of 5,000 at year one. Okay, so what if I owned it for two years? So if I owned it for two years, my operating costs would look like, if I owned it for two years, I'd have a year one is 5,000, and year two is 6,500. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find out what is the lump sum equivalent of that. So I'm going to do the same thing, equals NPV, refer to this interest rate of 10% with the dollar sign. And then the values, it's just the first two. If I own it until year two, I will have encountered the 5,000 and the 6,500. I'm going to want to drag this formula down rather than typing it in a bunch of times. And so I'm going to anchor the reference to C8. And that way, when I drag it down, it'll always start looking at the 5,000. But then whatever row I'm on, it will use that as the last value in this range. So see right now where it says C8 through C9? I'm going to put the dollar signs in front of C8 but I'm not going to put dollar signs in front of C9 because when I drag it down again, I want it anchored to look here for the first value in the range, but the last value in the range, I want that to be dependent on what row I'm in. Okay. So 9,917 is the lump sum equivalent if I just encounter the first two. All right, so if I do three years of ownership, then it's 8,000 in year three. And once again, I'm just finding out what is the present equivalent of that. So let me drag the formula down to the third row, and then we'll check to make sure that it's acting appropriately. So it's looking at the interest rate for the rate. That's good. And then the starting range. C8 is the first value, C9 is the second, C10 is the third. So that anchoring of the first one 
is, uh, is doing what we need it to do. So we can drag it all the way down. So the reason why we're finding out the lump sum present value of the operating costs is we want to now find out the annual equivalent of them. So the step that we're about to do as we go, D was just like an intermediate step. We needed to do column D so that we could calculate column E. What we're doing is this one. Do you remember when I showed you this slide and I said, instead of having different operating costs every year, what can we do to make it so that it's a constant amount uh, every year? So that is what's going to happen in step E. In step E, we're going to do equals PMT, and the rate is 10%. Anchor that reference with the F4 button or dollar signs. NPER is whatever row we're on. So the number of years, I'll just click on A8 for this first one. And then the present value is minus of this amount. So what it's going to do is it's going to take the present value and spread it out as an annual series. Now the first one is pretty anticlimactic because there's only a single year. So it's going to be the same as what we started with. It's going to look like nothing's happening. But for rows, you know, for years two, three, four, and five, it'll become, I think, more clear what this function is actually doing. So if you drag this formula down through the rest of the time, it's saying, if you owned it for four years, so you'd pay either 5000 in the first year, 6500 8000 9500 So let me write this one on the board. Year four is 9500 It's saying that that is equivalent to having every year 7,072. 1, 2, 3, 4. Amount is 70, 72. So we're finding out a constant annual equivalent amount of this sequence that's above it. So 5,000, then 6,500, then 8,000, then 9,500. You can either do that or its economic equivalent is to have 7072 every year for four years. Or if you owned it for five years, here's how your operating costs every year are going to look. So does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions so far? Okay. What's capital recovery? What are the two pieces that go into calculating capital recovery? It would be the, it would be, wait. Purchase price and salvage value. Good. That's right. So, so this next column, we're going to do something with the capital initial purchase price. We're going to do the salvage value, and we want to find the annual equivalent of it. So there's no function called the capital recovery function, but there is a PMT function. And capital recovery is an equal annual payment. So we're going to use, as it says in the template file down here, for, uh, for column E, oh, we've already done E. For column F, the payment of both the first cost and the market value. OK, so equals. PMT and the rate will lock our reference up to the interest rate. NPER is whatever row you're on corresponding to the year. Okay. Now, present value. The, the amount of money that is at the present is the first cost. That was the purchase price of 20000 
So I'm going to do minus of the amount because I think payment is one of those functions that is going to flip the sign. So we have to manually override that with the negative sign. So that ends up not being the case. We'll just take those minus signs out. But I think that it is. Okay, so a reference to the uh, present value, and we need to anchor that reference because when we drag the formula down, we don't want it looking anywhere else. We always want it looking at the 20,000 when it comes to the present value. So F4 there. All right, and then a comma, future value. It is the market value. So if you own it for one year, then the market value is 10,000. If you own it for two years, the market is 8,000. So it's going to be minus of this market value. And I'm not locking the reference with the dollar signs there because as I drag the formula down, I don't want it always looking at 10,000. If I own it for two years, the market value is only 8,000. If I own it for three, it declines to 6,000. So just to revisit, the interest rate is 10%. NPR is whichever year we're on. The PV is the first cost, and we use the minus of the amount. And the future value is the market value. And again, we use the minus of the amount. And so what it says here is that if we own the item for just a single year, then the capital recovery cost would be $12,000. And that takes into account the time value of money, of course. If we drag this formula down, it tells us how much the ownership cost is for each duration, just based on capital recovery. So what we saw in that figure is kind of happening. You know, the figure that we looked at shows capital recovery costs goes down with ownership duration and the annual worth of annual operating costs increases with increasing ownership duration. So operating costs are going up, capital recovery costs are going down. We want to know what's the total cost. That was that thick blue line in the figure. So we'll add them together, one plus the other. So how many years should we own this equipment to minimize our costs? Three. Three. Three years is the economic service life. The actual service life, this equipment has a physical service life of five years. Like that's how long until it physically is useless and no longer does its task. But its economic service life is different from its physical service life. Its economic service life tells us that if our objective is to minimize expenses. What we ought to do is keep the item for three years and then sell it because our costs are increasing. So let me annotate this uh, spreadsheet with our answer here. The economic service life of this equipment is five years. All right, I'll highlight it. It's already bold. Highlight this. Make it easy to find so that whoever's grading would be able to know that we've done more than just punch numbers. We've actually interpreted and applied the analysis here. Oh, did I say five? You're right, three. Thank you. That's critical thinking. Good. All right, so we should own this equipment for three years. Um, so that's it. That's the hardest thing you're going to learn this semester. I mean, it's debatable. Maybe you thought that the external rate of return is more difficult. But my experience is just looking at hundreds of exams over the years is uh, this economic service life analysis seems to be one of the two concepts that students struggle with the most. So. If you want to do well on the second exam, you should practice this. You know, like we've just gone through it together. 
what you should do is delete everything, including what I gave you. Just delete it all and fill it in again and see, can you remember, like, what's the technique? Which formula did you apply? And, you know, the, the reminders is down here in the template. So practice again. And then start with a blank, a blank worksheet without the, uh, the hand-holding of the instructions at the bottom and see, could you do an economic service life with nothing but a blank workbook? Because that's what you're going to need to do on an exam. Um, on the exam, you're not just going to open up a template file that I've provided you. You're not going to open up your previous homework assignment. You're going to start with a blank workbook and find the economic service life um, just off the dome, so to speak. Now, I will say on the second exam, I'm going to allow you to bring in your own set of notes in addition to the equation that uh, equation packet that I give you. You're going to be able to bring in a, um, a set of reminders on how to set things up. And so you could like give yourself a little summary on how do you do external rate of return? How do you do economic service life? So you're not going to have to really memorize everything. You could, on that handout that I give you, or on the uh, equation sheet that you prepare, you could like remind yourself what are the column titles that you should use in economic service life analysis. So you will be starting from a blank workbook on the second midterm exam, but you can also have kind of the safety net of your own summary on how to solve these methods. Okay, um, that's all I have for you today. If you want to stick around, like if there was something that uh, you didn't get, I can help you find your uh, mistake if there's anything that you need help with. Yeah, let's try, that, uh, let's try that QR code again. If it wasn't working before, maybe it will be working now. Looks like it's working now. Okay.